Welcome, folks, to Prophecy USA Bible Study Podcast. My name is Rick Pearson, and this podcast is designed to specifically unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. I'm I'm coming to you live from our studio, not live, but pre-recorded in our studio here in Florida. And uh, Karen's not with me; she's still down south. But we're going to do a little bit differently. I'm going to do a little teaching here, and then we're going to cut to our brand new TV show, which has not been aired, from Poland, Auschwitz, Poland. We have a special guest Auschwitz from Auschwitz, Poland, and then we're going to intervene back and come back to Florida here, and I'm going to talk about what was said. But before we start, I want to lay a ground uh, foundation for you. Matthew 7, 1 says, Judge not, lest ye be judged, for with the same measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you. Now, most of you know we're down in Florida, and we're promoting our book, uh, The Hour That Changes Everything, and uh, we're getting uh, a lot of good comments, but we're also getting some negative comments from different people as we place this book on Facebook and different uh, articles, and people are commenting. Of course, people comment whether you want them or not. You always enjoy the good comments, and the other comments sometimes frustrate you a bit but we're getting both and you expect non-believers to be apprehensive negative and even demeaning because that's just the way th that the bible said jesus said in matthew 4 14 the sower sows the word and these are they which by the wayside this is matthew or mark 4 14 these are they which by the wayside where the word is sown but when they heard the word, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they, likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves. So endure but for a time, and afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended." Many, many Christians get offended when they start witnessing. And what we're going to talk about today is not being offended. Okay? In Mark 10, it says, There's no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and friends and brethrens, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Now, when you start witnessing or start sharing your faith, you have to expect people who don't believe, uh, sometimes, many times, they'll persecute you. They don't like what you're saying. They don't get it. But the hard part is when your own brethren start persecuting you. This is another level of persecution that comes. And in Philippians 3.13, it says, Brethren, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Paul said to press for, press forward for the high calling. And as many be perfect, be thus minded. That word perfect, according to the Greek-English lexicon, means meeting the highest standard. Uh, it, it means of persons who are fully up to standard in a certain respect and not satisfied with halfway measures. Uh, the third thing it means is pertaining to maturity, being full-grown, mature, or an adult. You have to learn as you move on with God. As you express the thoughts in, in this book, the Holy Bible, the, the, the world's going to reject this word. And the words in you, it's going to reject you. They persecuted Jesus. They'll also persecute you. So you have to get used to getting some persecution without being offended. 
And we have all kinds of comments that are coming through as we advertise our book. Uh, some are very complimentary. Some are very ne negative. Um, now here's one of, of one of the comments that we had. Uh, and I'm going to say this is from uh, Negative Ned Gnarly. Now Negative Ned Gnarly is a Christian. He gets this ad on Facebook and immediately he responds because there's a book being offered about American Bible prophecy and he doesn't agree with that whatsoever. And so he sends us this response and he, he openly says it on Facebook so everybody can see it. He says, this is prophet-driven prophet preaching. Every generation puts a book out about revelations in the end time. None of them are accurate. All our speculations are best, but all purport to be the one that knows and must buy to learn the answers. They're no better than the Pharisees that were selling at the synagogues that Jesus kicked out for profiting. Now, this is a sincere Christian man who reads an ad and immediately he judges it. Immediately, he judges it without even reading it. So I sent this uh, negative Ned Gnarly, I call him. <laughs> I sent him this answer. Uh, let's just call his name Ned. Ned, when someone preaches the gospel message on TV for free, gives out free apps, offers free videos from a free website with a video-on-demand uh, uh, platform, giving biblical teachings of Christ, and then writes a book which costs thousands of dollars to produce, encouraging people to come to Christ, you call that a Pharisee? Now, that's absolutely ridiculous statement, Mr. Gnarly, which proves you have not read our book and what you accuse us of being is actually what you yourself are doing. Because the scribes and the Pharisees discourage people from listening to the gospel message of Jesus. And it's quite astonishing that you are a Christian and yet you're discouraging people from writing a book about Jesus, how to be born again, and the signs of the times. Now, Jesus said he is the spirit of prophecy. I don't know what spirit is driving you, but I can guarantee you it's not the same spirit that has called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So negative Ned Gnarly responds, <laughs> responds to that with, with this. So where do you get all the money to do all, do all this? It sounds to me you have a good scam going there, Rick, to keep yourself in business. Oh, but then you are a tax-free organization and do not have to disclose how much you profit from it or how much your salary is. I get it. Now, this is a man that we've never met. He's never read our stuff. He's never listened to our TV program. He's never read the book. But he comes on and he calls us a Pharisee without even an inkling of knowing what we're saying. So I thought, you know, I, I have to, I'm going to respond to this fellow in a nice way, but I want you folks to know something. This is how I got on television. Here's my answer to Ed Gnarly. Ned Gnarly. <laughs> Ned, after 32 years in business, I'm paying for all this with my own life savings. I cannot afford to give away books, but if I could, I would. Now, he responds... And all of a sudden now, he is my newfound friend, Ned Nicely. <laughs> and he says, great, I like you then. Now, I don't usually take too much time with everybody on this because I can't answer every heckler. But it astounds me how Christians come on and they're so judgmental over things that they don't even know what they're talking about. Now, it's okay to have a different interpretation of Scripture. But, you know, it says in Matthew 12, 36, I say unto you, 
that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the judgment day. For by your words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, our mandate, as we've said many times at Prophecy USA, I was given this revelation about America, and Ezekiel said, uh, O wicked, uh, when I say unto, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Ezekiel 33, 8, I'm just going to paraphrase it. When I show you that calamity is coming, and you do not warn people, and they die in their sins, they'll die in their sins, but their blood I'll require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the people and, and they still do not turn away from their sin and die in their sin, they will die in their sin, but you have delivered your soul. I'm basically today delivering my soul on television, in the book, and what we're trying to say is we believe America's in Bible prophecy. Now today we're going to do something that we've never done before. I want you to listen to a man's experience. This is my experience as, I, as we're moving on into this ministry. And by the way, we're acquiring more TV programs as we go. And we're going to get this word out. And it is controversial, and I know that. Um, but we love America. We're not against America. But we've got a problem, and Bible prophecy is going to be fulfilled. So today, I want to do something we've never done. We're going to go into a TV show that we've never aired yet. Now, why is that? Because it's something you, uh, you may have to listen two or three times before, before this half-hour show sinks in. Um, it's 30 minutes, and, it's, it, and it was done in Auschwitz, Poland, with a friend of mine called Irving Roth. And um, I will come back after the program airs. We've taken off the front, front of the program so you don't have to listen to all the intro and music again. But we're going to play that program. And then at the end, I'm going to come back and I'm going to share some things with you that I cannot say on television. And I can't say it on television because right now we're having censors. And if I get censored off of television, we're done. Now, they're, they're even censoring me on Facebook, so we have to be very careful. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And Irving is 80-some years old, a Holocaust survivor, and he's going to say some things that are his opinion of what he sees happening right now around the world. And he's going to say it from Auschwitz, Poland, uh, at the number one death camp that the Germans had. It's an extremely interesting show, and I hope that you'll enjoy it. We're gonna go to that right now, to the intro. Welcome back to Prophecy USA. I'm currently in our U.S. office in Clearwater, Florida, while COVID-19 restrictions are being enforced throughout Canada. We're visiting various radio and TV and news stations throughout the U.S. doing interviews concerning our number one best-selling book on Amazon, The Hour That Changes Everything. You know, this book is a culmination of 35 years of research. It gives you an in-depth study of what ancient prophets foretold and what the book of Revelation reveals as to America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, Daniel was told to seal the book for it was not for him to understand the words he had written, but the mysteries would be revealed in the latter days. This book will unveil those mysteries in real time and show you the 53 descriptions of America as described in God's holy word. However, one of the most sobering revelations that I have ever experienced in my life was in April of 2019 when my wife Karen and I joined a small group of believers for an on-site history lesson from Holocaust survivor Irving Roth. You may never visit Auschwitz yourself, but you can still see with your eyes what happens when a nation leaves God and embraces the godless influence of secular humanism. We'll begin our introduction to Auschwitz exactly as Irving was introduced at the age of 14 years old. 
the door of a cattle car opened, and Nazi soldiers pointed their bayonets at unarmed Jewish children and shouted, Welcome to Auschwitz. Listen to this. It's three quarters of a century ago that I arrived in this place, in this type of a vehicle, a cattle car. And as you look at the cattle car, you see it, there is a lock. But in addition to the lock, there was also a seal on it to make sure it's not open until it left the ghetto and arrived in Auschwitz. However, as we left the ghetto in Hungary, crossed into Slovakia, and a day's day went by, and suddenly the train stops in the middle of nowhere. Along comes the guard and opens up sufficiently to be able to still contain the seal, but enough to be able to say something inside. And he says, where you're going, you don't need any money. So hand over all your Hungarian money, or German money, and even dollars. And so that's what we did. Another hour, a few hours go by, and suddenly we're in another area where there's nothing in the middle of nowhere. Again, the opening of the door. I want all your watches, all your rings. And a third time. By the third time, this is the, just hassling, and imagine two days have gone by, and you're inside this box. And my grandfather shouts out, he says, you asked us for money, we gave it to you. We give you everything else, so stop bothering us. And if you want to, you can shoot me. Now, at the time, my grandfather was 65 years old. And the guard in German says, get back in there, old man, or I'll shoot you. I give you this story because these people are in business for themselves. But essentially, they were not supposed to do that. It's supposed to all be gathered together, uh, pa repackaged, and so sent to Berlin, to a central station with the gold and the money and everything else belongs to the government, of course. But all these people were in business for themselves. In many ways, one can look upon this behavior as a totally lawless society. Lawless in that every person who was in charge of a particular group, of a particular place, whether he was a mayor of a town or he was the head of the SS in a village, he became the law. As it was expressed once, uh, I remember reading something about this. Uh, one day someone was complaining to uh, Himmler saying, I don't understand what's going on. I know in my unit there are a number of people who have Jewish blood in them. How can that be? After all, if you, by law, if you have three Jewish grandparents, you're only going to Jew, and that's it. But in my unit, in the SS unit, you have some people who have grandparents who are all four grandparents who are Jewish. And his answer was, I determine who is a Jew. So in many ways, it was really a lawless society. And so finally the train arrives, it stops. We actually stopped outside of the camp as we came in, remember through that little entrance? We were outside, it was late afternoon. Eventually, the train pulls in to one of these three tracks. These three tracks were built in the spring of 1944. The reason they were, originally there was just one track coming in. Like from Slovakia, we may have had 50,000 people come, and that's about it because that's all the Jews there were. Now a new transport is gonna come, the rest remnant of the Jewish people of Europe from Hungary, close to three, half a million dollars, half a million people. And so they felt that when the trains come in, they may come in multiple trains at the same time. What are they gonna do? And so they split this up into three. So you have multiple areas where you could discharge people. So we arrive here. By the time my train is located approximately 
Well, he does not remember. This is a very long piece of track. That's because there were 50 cars or 60 cars sometimes. And then the doors are slid open. And all you hear is, Peraus, mach schnell, get out quickly. Take nothing with you. Leave everything in place. What did I have? I have the small little suitcase and some underwear and some food, but no, I'm no longer allowed to own that. I get off the train, behind me is my brother, behind him is my grandfather, grandmother, and 10-year-old cousin, members of extended family. We get off the train. Nothing, we have nothing with us. And form lines. I was 14 years old and I'm looking around. Where is this place? Where am I? As I turn, forming lines in this direction. On the right-hand side and off to the left-hand side, I see flames coming out of chimneys. My cousin turns to me and says, what kind of factory do you think this is? I do not remember my answer, but he did. In 1990, he was here with a group of students from Israel and relates his story. And so they asked, so what did your cousin Irving say? Well, you already don't know my cousin Irving. He turned to me and says, I know. You're going to make soap out of us. But if I become a bar of soap, I refuse to bubble. You know, it's hard to believe that this actually happened just 75 years ago. And it's also very sobering to know that Hitler was not only voted in by secular humanists, but also Christians who abandoned their faith from in God we trust to in government we trust. Stay tuned as we continue our life lessons from Auschwitz with our tour guide, Holocaust survivor, Irving Roth. Welcome back. We're touring Auschwitz today with Holocaust survivor Irving Rock. Irving has told us of his shocking cattle car arrival into his prison camp, but what comes next is absolutely horrifying. And it's hard to imagine that these things actually happen, but Irving assures us they certainly did. Listen to this. And so standing in formation like this, and suddenly the whole line begins to move. Suddenly I'm facing a man in uniform, dressed beautifully with shiny boots and a riding crop in his hand. And he says very little. He just moves his riding crop, rests on links to the right and to the left. <coughs> Most of the people are going to the right in this direction. A few to the left. Very soon, I lose sight of my grandfather and grandmother, my aunt, my 10-year-old cousin, because they're going in this direction. Buildings that have chimneys and flames. We marched over to the left, under guard, of course, to another part of the camp, and we walking into a barracks-like thing, and the number of chairs there, and people who have shears in their hands, and tell us to get undressed, take our clothing away. So now I have nothing of mine except a pair of boots. But eventually I lose that too. They shave us, they spray us with something, probably a disinfectant, and now I'm wearing a striped gray and blue pair of pants, jacket and hat, and stand in formation for hours and end. It is now midnight maybe, maybe one o'clock in the morning, and we haven't eaten in a while. We have not been able to go to the, to relieve ourselves. Haven't gotten any water. And finally they tell us we, mu we must enter a building. And in this building, there's nothing but on both sides, what I call shelves, deep six foot shelves. One close to the ground, another one about two feet above that, two feet more and two feet more. And that's where all of us are supposed to go and sleep. And we do because it's late at night. We are hungry, thirsty. 
can't leave. And of course, within minutes, most of us are asleep in this very strange place. But before we turn around, it's morning. The whistle is blowing. Everybody out, at us. Information, we're counted. And then, a marvelous piece of information. You now may enter the latrine. We'll visit one of those. It's not exactly something that uh, you would want to spend any time in. But it was, and you'll see it later on, it's a slab of concrete. The length of the whole barracks with holes side by side. And on either side is a pipe. And in spaces about a couple of feet apart, there's a spigot. That, my friends, was the bathroom. But not that you could sit there as long as you wanted. Very quickly, we're told to get out. I mean, standing in formation again in front of our building. And suddenly I see that a number of uh, people, maybe a half a dozen, are bringing along small little desk, like a school desk. And next to each one of those desks is a chair. And we call to sit down one at a time to these places roll up our sleeves, he takes out a hypodermic needle, at least it looked that way to me, and an inkwell, fills it up with ink, tells me to roll up my sleeves, and suddenly begins to poke my hand very quickly as I look down. Now I have a number tattooed on my arm. I'm no longer a person with a name. I am now a number. I am branded <coughs> just the way cattle is branded. I'm the property of the German government. That they made sure that I understand. And besides that, once it's tattooed, you can't take it off. And therefore, should you be by any strange and stretch of the imagination escape, they'll find you. They'll know where you're from. That, my friends, was my introduction to this place called Auschwitz II, the death camp. 1.1 million people of Jewish faith were brought here, maybe 1.2 million. Some others, too. This is where they were murdered in a period of two years or maybe 28 months. 1.1 million Jews, 10% of the Jewish population of all of Europe was brought here in that period of time and murdered. Based on propaganda and lies, things which have absolutely nothing to do with the reality. Not, my friends, the scary part. It all began with words. In Germany, it began with words at the bottom of a newspaper. On top is the name, the Sturmer, the Stormtrooper. On the bottom, in German, the Jews are our misfortune. They are the cause of every problem. You read article after article in the Sturmer. It began in the 1920s. Nobody paid attention. By 1932, that political party, and as you saw the, num the name of that in the exhibit, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, was the largest single party in Germany, and they were elected to run the government. Folks, I want you to think about what Irving just told us. The Nazi Socialist Party was elected to run the government. You know, in 605 BC, the prophet Jeremiah wept before Israel was handed over to the Babylonian rule, and she was judged severely for her sins. They were shedding innocent blood in the name of Baal worship because they thought they would be rewarded financially by this pagan god, Moloch. 
It had become the law of the land and embracing by, by those who were in leadership. But Jeremiah rebuked the people saying, you have strengthened the hands of evildoers. Think about that, folks, the next time you cast your vote for the policies of a political party, because God is watching. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our tour of Auschwitz. I want you to listen carefully as Irving Roth, Holocaust survivor, unveils not only the history of German concentration camps, but gives us a hint of the future plans of the Antichrist. Watch how methods of tracking Jewish inmates of 1942 concentration camps reflect the new high-tech policies that the Bible foretells is coming with the new world order. Listen to this. The Nazi party came to power through the ballot. People were convinced through propaganda that the reason World War I was fought is because of the Jews. Absolutely nothing to do with the Jews. The fact that Germany lost the war, World War I, that is, is the fault of the Jews. The reason you don't have a job in Germany in the 1920s, because of the Jews. The reason you have inflation and depression is because of the Jews. World depression was caused by the Jews, not by the stock market, not by the manipulation, but by the Jews. And people are convinced of that. But there's another piece to it. The propaganda against the Jews was one piece, but there's a second piece. I call it seduction. They use it very, very strongly. How do you go from a number of people, maybe a dozen, maybe two, maybe seven, of this ideology called National Socialism to the Holocaust? How do you convince people? A part of it, of course, began with convincing <laughs> ex-army people to vote for this political party. How is it? Very simply. Remember, the Versailles Treaty prohibited Germany from having an army. So imagine you're a colonel in the German army during World War I, and now suddenly there is no army. You have no job. You have no skills other than being a colonel. What do you do? How do you feed your family? Along comes the Nazi party, says, we will reinstate the army. You will become a colonel again. People need not only respect you, but salute you. And you'll be able to support your family in great style. Oh, by the way, it's all the fault of the Jews. The second piece is seduction. And once that happens, and that happens, by the way, interestingly enough, they take power, as you well know, at the beginning of 1933, in fact, in January. The first anti-Jewish law comes about 60 days later. That law says that do not buy anything from a Jew. Do not use any Jewish products. Jewish stores have to be marked by a Jewish star with the word Yuda. In front of the stores are members of the Nazi party stormtroopers in uniform with clubs convincing you you shouldn't go in and support these terrible people who are at fault that you don't have a job. And so within a matter of weeks, the first step is boycott. And that is why when 10 years ago the concept of a boycott divestment and sanctions against Israel came along, I screamed and yelled at the top of my voice. That's the first step, guys. Unfortunately, people don't always pay attention. Because after all, did the German people stop buying Jewish products? No. So financially, it was not a success. 
but politically, emotionally, and psychologically. It was the first step and accept it. I call those signposts along the road to Auschwitz. The signs were there, big and bold. Nobody bothered to them. If there's one thing we need to learn from the Holocaust, is those signposts along the road. And when we see them, we must recognize them. There are those in the world today who would like to repeat this with a vengeance, with more modern technology. That's why I thank you for being here this early in the morning, listening to me. So tomorrow and the next day, we can look at the headlines in the newspaper. So tomorrow, we can listen to the radio and to the talking heads philosophizing about oppression, about Jews. So sometimes we think in terms of it was a closed society nobody knew. People knew, the world knew. And they looked down and said what we always say, it ain't my problem. You know, we stated in the last segment that Hitler was voted into power not only by secular humanists, but also by naive Christians. However, some did not fall for the propaganda that the socialists were peddling. One Luther minister named Dietrich Bonhoeffer raised up a shout against Hitler and tried to warn people what was coming. Now, sadly, most people did not listen. And Bonhoeffer was eventually arrested by the German Gestapo, taken to a concentration camp, and on April 9th of 1945, he was, he was hanged. The Bible says that before Latter-day Babylon is judged by fire, his people are going to raise up a shout of warning against her. But my question is, will we be like Bonhoeffer or will we be like those who cannot remember the past and are condemned to repeat it? We're out of time, folks. My name is Rick Pearson, and I'm reminding you that Jesus is alive, and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. See you next week on Prophecy USA. Welcome back to Florida, folks. I hope you enjoyed that uh, very sobering trip to Auschwitz, Poland. You know, Irving really makes you think what he saw with his eyes and what he experienced. Irving passed away several months ago, and he was a, a dear, gentle, kind, loving person. Um, he was such a nice man, and we, Karen and I immediately fell in love with Irving. Uh, but you know, as Karen and I journeyed through those death camps, it was just unbelievable that men could be so cruel. And it's also unbelievable that the signpost that Irving was shown back then, now we can see the same signpost rising right here under our noses in America. This is one of the signs of America being in Bible prophecy. Uh, so as we study the scripture, and as we watch the news, and as we meditate on the word, for those of you who understand what we're trying to warn at Prophecy USA, I really feel like we're being a type of Bonhoeffer to a certain extent. But Bonhoeffer did not have the word of God backing him in what the Lord showed him that was coming. And we do all through scripture, 53 descriptions of Babylon the Great. We meet every description. And yet the opposition to the word of God, as I shared before we went to, to Auschwitz, not only comes from non-believers, but it's coming from believers like negative Ned Gnarly. And the church is full of folks like that who are so steeped and so rigid in what they've been taught, they cannot get out of that. And so they condemn others. And we do not want to be like that. You know, this Bible study is given to help each of us, myself included, to become more Christ-like in our daily walk, stop judging others 
and judge yourself. Now, you, you might say, well, you're judging it, judging Ned Gnarly. Well, I think Ned Gnarly's words uh, judge, judge him. How he come across, how he said he did, you know. Uh, so there's a difference between judging and discerning, but I'm discerning. I don't want to be like negative Ned Gnarly. Uh, now, everyone has a right to their opinion, but just remember something. We all will give account for every word that comes out of our mouth. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of the judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You know, you'll not be judged by the words that come out of anyone else's mouth. Only the words that come out of your mouth. And uh, you'll be judged also by how you respond to their words. So you don't want to get into shouting matches with people over doctrine. But Ephesians 4.26 says, be ye angry. It sometimes it makes you angry when this, you know, I'm trying to reach people and Christians are coming on and they're saying negative things about me and I'm trying to lead people to Christ. Now, what, where does, what kind of spirit is that? Now, if I don't agree with someone, it's okay to disagree. But when you come on and you start throwing dirt and mud and you're a Pharisee and you're, you know, that is the wrong spirit, folks. So the Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, Be ye angry and sin not. Let, the, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now you have to forgive people instantaneously, but you can discern what spirit's working through them. And once you discern, like the sons of Issachar, uh, Issachar, the sons of Issachar discern the signs of the times, we are discerning the signs of the times. But just remember, folks, not everybody can discern it. Not everybody can see what we're seeing. Because remember, Babylon falls into darkness, and that darkness also comes into the church. So if you are learning from our TV program and uh, it's blessed you and you can see what I'm seeing, count yourself fortunate because, you know, it says that uh, it, when the bride gets into heaven, uh, once she's raptured, it says they're rejoicing and they're happy for she's clothed herself in robes of white and the bride hath made herself ready. When you read this book, don't read it to judge others. Read it to judge yourself. Don't read it to try and make somebody else a better person. Read it to make yourself a better person. So that's the thing that I wanted to emphasize today. And we are all Bonhoeffers. We know what the Word says, just like Bonhoeffer knew what Hitler was all about. The signposts are all around us. And those signposts, sometimes they make me angry. Sometimes I get angry when I listen to the news and I know people are lying through their teeth. And they're trying to mislead thousands and thousands of people. But you know what? You can discern that. And it does make you angry, but be angry and sin not because it, they're doing exactly what the Bible said they do. Even Christians who will miss the rapture because they don't have oil in their lamps, like the 25 vir like the Matthew 25 and the 12, 10 virgins. Half of them missed it.
They were still virgins. They were still Christians. They still loved God. They were still under the blood of Jesus, but they weren't walking with him. And Jesus said they were not counted worthy to escape. He warns us. So as we move on, folks, strive to let the life of Christ be made manifest in you, in your mortal flesh. This is the goal of, of, of these Bible studies. It's the goal of my TV show. It's the goal of what Irving was saying, to read the signposts. Now, the Jews in 1939 had no way of escape, but we do. The Holocaust that's coming, we can escape it. It's promised. There's an open door. <laughs> Strive for the open door. We're voting pre-trib rapture. You've heard me say it a million times. But strive to get close to God. Get close to God. Get in His Word. And He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That's the promise He's given us. So folks, this is, this is uh, I think, our 69th podcast. And... Uh, Within a week or two, I'm going to be back home. Karen will be joining us, and we're going to be doing, we're not going to be repeating podcasts. We're going to be doing new ones. Uh, for a season, we had to repeat, but now we're, we're moving ahead. So in another, uh, next week, we have one more to do, and then I'll be home this, in two weeks. I'll be home. Karen will be with me, and probably you'll see Cody popping his head up. That's our little dog. Uh, you might see him in the room too. So we want to bless you and remind you that Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. Stay in the faith, stay in the word, be a kind one to another, and let the life of Christ be made manifest in your mortal flesh. We'll see you next week on Bible Study Podcast, Prophecy USA.